Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's so good to see you here. And for those of you watching at home, welcome to our online worship experience. We're so blessed that uh, last week we could only feed 100 people. And this week we were allowed to double that. We didn't get to that point yet, but I'm sure that pretty soon we will. And uh, it is a blessing to, like I said last week, to actually preach and have you here. Uh, believe me, preaching to the camera, hoping that you were watching and not falling asleep in your PJs and your couch, it, it, it was challenging. But having you here, at least I know you're here and you're watching. So that's an awesome, an awesome blessing. Before we dive into the message today, I'd like to pray in this special Sabbath. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings and thank you for allowing us to worship in this place. Father, we missed each other so much. And even though we haven't been able to hug and to kiss and all the things that we did before, this gives us hope to know that this is soon will be over. And there's going to be one day where there will be no restrictions, no limitations, no distance, because we will be together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever thought, man, if I could have only a little bit more week, I will get all the stuff that I need to do done. You see, one of the problems with humanity is that we have so many things to do and very little time. In fact, I'm going to show you a picture this morning, and, and I know what, that you know what it is. This is Mount Rushmore. And, and you know, when this construction began in 1920, uh, the, the designer of the whole thing, his name was Goldson Borglum, and I will ask you about that name later on. Uh, he began to work on this statue all the way until 1941. The idea was that the sculpture of each one of the presidents will go all the way down to the waist. But he died. His son took over in March when his father died. His son Lincoln took over, and he didn't finish because at the end in October 41. They ran out of money, and they concluded that. So even one of the landmarks of our country is not finished. So when you don't get something finished in your life, don't get so worried. Because the reality is that there's been only one person on earth who has gotten the job done. In fact, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus was hanging on the cross, and at the end of his suffering... At the end of his suffering, he said the most amazing words that we could ever hear. And if you come with me to the scripture, let, let's go to John chapter 19, verse 30. This was our Bible reading for this morning. And, and notice what it says. Uh, by the way, you can get the notes on the Thursday mail. You can get the notes on our, on our church online app. You can get the notes on our website. So you can follow along. You can always do that. You can print them at home or have them on your device. Either way. Uh, but it's nice that we follow along. Notice what it says. John 19, verse 30. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, this phrase, it is finished, is what we call as Christians the call of victory. You see, Jesus had been on the cross and his throat was parched. He had been hanging there for a few hours and now he is ready to say the most important words in Christian history. But before that, he needed to have a drink. He needed to, to hydrate his throat so that he can yell it out. In fact, the Greek and, 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 the, and the tense that is conjugated, this phrase, it's only one word. Tetelestai. But Jesus needed to have his throat ready to utter the most important words in human history. And the way he said it was loud enough for everyone in that place to hear. He said, it is finished. It is completed. It is done. There's nothing more to do. And, and you see, because these are the most important words in history, there's no other words that can summarize Christianity like it is finished do. 
You see, for the Romans, they thought, okay, he said it is done. They thought, we did our job, we killed them. For the religious people of the time, they figure, okay, he is dying, he's finished. We don't have to worry about him anymore. For Pilate, he thought, okay, my headache is over. Even for the disciples, when they heard the word, it is finished, they thought the dream is gone. But he didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. But what? What did Jesus finish? So let's look at what is the thing that Jesus finished on the cross. Like I said, the word it is finished, the phrase in Greek, it's just one word. It is the telestide. And it's sums up all our beliefs, all, all of our hopes, all of our dreams as the children of God. If, if you get this one phrase in your Christian experience, you, you discover right away how Christianity is different from all the other religions. Because in every other religion, the believer has to do something to earn the favor of their God. But in Christianity, our God did everything on our behalf. And it is finished. You see, this phrase makes all the difference. So again, what did Jesus finish on the cross? The word tetelestai in Greek had five different meanings. And Jesus fulfilled each one of those meanings. The first one, the first meaning, was used by a servant who worked for an employer. And when that servant was assigned a task, a responsibility, at the end of the day, he would come back to the master and said, Tetelestai, it is done. It is finished. So in our behalf, Jesus fulfilled what God had promised us. For thousands of years, we read the scriptures and we find that there are promises. They have these prophecies, as we call them, regarding a Messiah who would come to the earth to provide salvation, to provide healing, to provide restoration, redemption, and hope for the decaying humanity. So Jesus as the Messiah, as this redeeming Savior, came to the earth to fulfill what the scriptures said. In fact, in the Old Testament, there's 380, 380 different prophecies regarding the job that the Messiah needed to accomplish to get it done. If you come with me to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 22, verse 44, we, we find the words that the Gospel describes as this very experience. And it says, Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, notice what is happening here. Jesus is taking his disciples on a trip back to the Old Testament. Because he said, first, in the law of Moses. In the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament in Hebrew, that section of the books of the law of Moses was known as one word, the Torah. The Torah represented the law. In fact, we, today we know it as the Pentateuch because those five books, the very first books of the Old Testament represented the law of Moses. So he's saying in those first books, it was written what I had to do. And then it says in the prophets, but in the Old Testament, we find two kinds of prophets. And in our Bible, we call them today the minor prophets and the major prophets. And it's not because they were in importance. They're only major and minor because of the size of the books and the Bible. So all the rest of the Bible, whatever is left, is the Psalms. Or as we call it today, the poetic writings. 
So notice what is happening here. Jesus is telling the disciples and the Torah and the prophets and the Psalms in all the Old Testament, throughout the whole Testament, there's been prophecies about me that I am fulfilling before you. Notice what verse 45 says. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now this is so powerful. Then he opened their minds to understand scripture. You, you, you understand this, right? That many times we try to read the scripture to confirm what we already believe. When we read the scripture in that way, we don't let God speak to us. God constantly is trying to open our minds so that we can understand scripture in its totality. That's why Paul says that by renewing our minds, we'll be transformed to the image of Christ. Now notice what it says in verse 46. And he said... Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and, and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaiming the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sin for all who repent. So notice what Jesus is telling his disciples that whatever was spoken of about the Messiah in the Old Testament, he came. To fulfill it. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says, For all of God's promises had been fulfilled in Christ. Paul understood what Jesus was telling his disciples. And when Jesus said it is finished, it was because it was the completion of the job that the Messiah needed to fulfill in the name of God. All those prophecies that spoke of him in the Old Testament when Jesus excelled his last breath. Were fulfilled. The second meaning of tetelestai is a legal term. In fact, this is a legal term used by judges. When, when someone completed, completed their sentence in prison, at the end the judge will stamp it. Tetelestai. Completed. When somebody had to carry a punishment and it was administered and the person went through the punishment, the judge will stamp that document, the telestai. It is done. Or if a sentence was commuted, the judge will stamp in the name of that person, the telestai. It is completed. So on the cross, for our behalf, Jesus not only fulfill what God has promised to us, but He also satisfied, satisfied what God's justice required. You see, in the world there are loss. In the universe there are loss. There are loss of physics. There are lo loss of chemistry and mathematics. And the universe moves according to this loss. In fact, God gave us moral and social laws and health loss. But there's two problems that we have with loss. The first one is that we are unable to fulfill them. We are unable in an orange strength to follow all the laws. And the second one, the second problem with us and loss is justice. Because justice requires that every time that a law is broken, there has to be a punishment. In Romans 8, the Apostle Paul writes in chapter uh, 8, verse 3, The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son in a body like the bodies that we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. Did you see it? Jesus could say it is finished because the punishment that we deserved as sinners, as individuals unable to fulfill and follow the law of God, deserved, He took it upon Himself. And by taking it on our behalf, not only he fulfilled all the law, but fulfilled the promises of justice. 
when the punishment was administered and somebody died on our behalf. All those little animals that died in the sanctuary process in the morning and in the afternoon were a symbol of the sacrifice that needed to take place in order for us to experience forgiveness and redemption. So it says in verse 4, he did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. There's three words we need to understand. The first word is the word justice. And justice is very plain. Justice means to receive what we deserve. That's justice, right? Receiving what we deserve. But when Jesus died on the cross, he gave us another word. And that is justification. And justification means that we don't receive the punishment that we deserve. So on the cross, Jesus not only died for justice... But he died offering to us justification. But there's a third word. And that is grace. And grace is receiving something better than what we deserve. And when Jesus died on the cross, he not only fulfilled justice, he not only offered justification, but he opened the door for grace to be part of our experience because by him dying on the cross, we don't have to die for the sins that we commit. In fact, we become participants and heirs of eternal life in heaven. And that is what grace is all about. So Jesus, as a judge, when he said, the Telestai, he was offering exactly what justice demanded. In verse 4 of Romans 10, it says, For Christ had already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, notice what it says, All who believe in Him are made right with God. So what Adam messed up in the garden, Jesus came to fix. And you see what happened is that sin, sin was never planned to be a part of the human experience. Sin should never be considered a fact of our reality. Sin should, sin should never be accepted. And sin should never be glorified because sin was never designed by God to be part of his creation. In fact, sin was not even in the plan. The third thing that, that the telestai means, it's also an accounting term, an accounting term. And accountants, after a bill was paid, they will stamp that account to Telestai. Paid in full. For our benefit, Jesus on the cross, he paid off the debt that we owed God. And you see in Colossians 2.14, it says, He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. What was the debt that we owed? Because we are sinners, we deserve to die, it says Paul in Romans. The wages of sin, of sin is death. But when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the debt. Notice what, what Colossians chapter 1 verse 14 says. Who purchased our freedom and forgave us our sins. Now imagine, imagine that the next thing you get in the mail, it's a letter that says, all your debt, all your bills have been paid by someone else. I know you're smiling, right? I, I can see you under the mask. 
Wouldn't that person that paid your bills would become your best friend? That is exactly why Jesus did it. Because he loves you in such a way that there's nothing that he would not do for you. So it's also to tell us that an accounting an accounting term. But also, to tell us that it, it is a term that artists used. You see, when a painter or a sculpture would, would be plastering on a wall or, or, or doing whatever kind of art, when he did the last time that, that brush and the paint and, and painted the last stroke or hit the hammer uh, the, with the hammer, the chisel for the last hit and chip away the last piece on that rock, that last stroke, the artist would say, Tetelestai, it is done. And on behalf of Jesus on the cross, he defeated the fear of death. Like an artist that, that, that needed to make sure that the masterpiece was completed, Jesus painted a beautiful picture. Notice what Romans 5.17 says. For the sin of one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over his sin and death through the, this one man, Jesus Christ. So notice what it says. It will live in triumph those who believe through Jesus Christ. And the voice of victory, the voice of triumph, when Jesus said, the Telestai, that was our call for victory. That it was done. That the, that the masterpiece that Jesus came to restore was completed. And you and I are part of that painting. You and I were thought about when Jesus was designing that event in Hebrews the author says in chapter 2, verse 14, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying, he could break the power of the devil. Who had the power of death? Verse 15, only in this way, only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as his slaves to fear the, of dying. Only in this way. If you ever ha had the chance to, to visit Italy, you'll find that some of the most amazing pieces of art are in that place. If you go to Florence, you can see the David. If you go to Milan, you see the um, Last Supper. And the museum and the Vatican has most of the most amazing pieces of art discovered from ancient Rome. But imagine, imagine that you go to Florence and you go to see the David. But there's someone who is ready with his belt, with tools, chisels, and a hammer. And is looking at the David and says, you know... Something is missing. I'm going to fix it. Right there you would say, this person is crazy. It's, the David is perfect. In fact, you don't need to go to Florence. You can go to Glendale to the forest lawn and there's a copy of it. And even the copy is amazing. So you would think this person is crazy. Now imagine. Jesus said, I did it all for you. But you said, no, 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 you no, know, no, see, it's not ready yet. I have to do this. I have to do this other thing. And oftentimes we get sour and angry and mad at God because we think that we have to do something that is impossible for us to accomplish, and we forget that Jesus already did it. Now, before you start writing emails to me, let me explain. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. Jesus already did it. But what he hasn't done, 
and he could never do is make you choose to love him back. We do things for God not because we'll help us to earn salvation, but because we want to love him back. So this is the way I see it. There are things that I do and things that I don't at home as a husband. Yeah, there's things that I don't do. Because if I do them, my wife would get mad. And there's things that I do that when I do them, she gets mad. Because I love her, I try not to do the things that I shouldn't do. Thank you. And I'm sure Paul is even happier about that. I don't do it because I'm going to be more married to her. I'm already married to her. If you believe in Jesus and you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, you're already saved. Well, at least two people said amen. See, in, we don't say amen because we think, oh, but there's still things that I have to fix in my life. Jesus already did it. What you get to do is to love him back. And when we love Jesus back, those things get corrected along the way. This is the promise. Paul said it clearly. The one who began the work in you will complete it until the day of his return. But salvation, it's already done. So the next time that you hear someone ask the question, are you saved? Amen. Jesus already did it. He already defeated death on the cross. The fifth meaning of the telestai was used by priests. And they used this word when there was a sacrifice to be done. And that animal had to be killed. Once they killed it and put it on the altar to be burned, the priest would say to Telestai, on the cross, on our behalf, Jesus destroyed evil's power to control us. In, first, in Colossians, actually chapter 1 of Colossians verse 13, Paul writes, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. And transfer us into the kingdom of his son. Notice that what Paul is saying here is not in future tense. It's in past tense. That means that it is already done. To tell his time. And he says in chapter 2 verse 15. In this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So Paul goes back to the moment when Jesus said to Telestai to affirm that what power, whatever power the devil had over us is done. Because Jesus already defeated them on the cross. So family, the most important moment for us is the moment when Jesus said to Telestai, finished. And Ephesians 2.8 2, 8 says... Saving all his idea and all his work, all we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play a major role. It is all God's work from start to finish. There is nothing we could have done to fight against temptation. There is nothing we can do to fight against sin. There is nothing we can do to fight against death. Jesus did it all. It was all Jesus, even before creation. In fact, I want to show you this, this text. Notice what it says. This is from Signs of the Times from November 4, 1908, just last week. Notice what it says. 
The plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth. Before the creation of the earth. Imagine, before God created us, he already said, okay, these guys are going to mess up. I love them so much that even before I make them and before they make the first mistake, I'm going to create a plan to bring them back. For Christ is a lamb foreordained. He was already planned. Before the foundation of the world. Isn't that amazing? That's why Jesus said, to tell us, imagine Jesus, even though it's a human, he didn't want to go through the trouble and the suffering of the cross. He knew it was his job to do. That is why when he went to the cross, even though he didn't go happily, he went willingly because he knew it needed to be done. And he was the one, the only one who could do it. The way I see what Jesus did on the cross, it's kind of like the day when the tunnel from London to Paris was finished. You see, we can go back in history and find that from 1802, yes, I said it right, 1802, there were ideas to make a tunnel to go from England to France on the water through the British Channel. But, of course, technology at the time didn't allow it. And they knew that it was going to be a monumental task. In fact, they had budgeted five billion pounds to do it and ended up costing 20 billion pounds. What makes it amazing is that the construction did not begin on one side, begin in one side and finish in the other. They actually started both at the same time from France and England. And they met in the middle. When they met, not only they accomplished a fit of engineering for the ages, but they open up the economy of both countries, in fact, the whole continent, in a different way. Transportation, uh, trade, tourism, all kinds of things. But you see, nothing happened until both sides met in the middle. Our humanity, our nature, of sin prevented us from meeting God face to face. So from our side, it was going to be impossible to be able to recover our place in the plan of God. So God sent Jesus, who became like one of us, who became a human. And as we read, he took our body. And when Jesus died on the cross, he made possible the one thing that for humanity was impossible. For us to meet God again. And through the cross, Jesus came to meet us right in the middle. Becoming human and dying on our behalf. Opening the channel to grace, to justice, and redemption. This weekend, we celebrate what we like to call Restoration Weekend. And we celebrate it not because it's in the calendar, not because everybody else is taking that week off. We celebrate it because it is the moment when, as human beings, we're given a second chance. It is the moment where all our tenets of faith are hanging from. Without this moment, everything else that we believe has no reason. Without the cross, Christianity would not exist. And without the cross, our future would not be available. So we celebrate this moment 
And we can say with joy that when Jesus said to Telestai, gave us a whole different meaning. Because everything that we owed, everything that we hoped on, everything that we experience today, as painful, as bad, as, as separations and diseases and even death, to tell us I has given us the assurance that one day those things will not exist anymore. And I can tell you that the fact that you are here today is a testament that God has been working in your hearts at some level that today you are here. And that He's working in the midst of this crazy pandemic that today we're allowed to gather in church again. I, I was praying that by this time we could be here. And in fact, I was kind of happy that we were given room for 100 people. And I told Harry a while ago, I hope that they let us be here by Easter. And in fact, last week I said, it would be great if they give us the double attendance by Easter. But see, what's going to be even greater is that when Jesus returns... We already registered. That we believe today that Jesus has done it all for me. And that for that day when he comes in the clouds of heaven and he takes our temperature, <laughs> he says, you're hot. <laughs> because if you look warm, it's not going to be good. And if you're cold, you're going to go to the place where it's going to be really hot. So today as we celebrate, let's remember that there's a better day coming. A better day that Jesus is already prepared for us. A better day where there's no separation, no pain, no diseases, no bad economies and no bad precedents. No abuses, no pain. But only the joy of those who with Jesus chanted that claim of victory. The Telestai. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, because you did it all for us. Thank you, Lord, because oftentimes our short minds as humans do not let us see the extent of your power and grace. And because many times we, we try to fix what you've done and we think, oh, there's something else that I need to do. I don't deserve it. Help us, Lord, to remember that it's not about this. It's never been about us deserving it. It's about you loving us. So, Father, today we claim that victory that, you give us, that you've given us on the cross, ours. And we pray for the power to love you back. And as we do so, make us more and more like Jesus. In his name we thank you and we praise you. Amen.